Hello, I'm Shane Bergen. I'm a physicist from University College Dublin. And I'm Jane Chaddock. I'm a dormant volcanologist uh, who's interested in education. And this is 101. And 101 looks at lots of different aspects of learning, uh, including how play can actually feed into really effective learning. And in this episode, we're going to meet Neve Shaw. Neve is a Dublin-based science communicator, and she's attending a workshop in University College Dublin. And it's a workshop on science communication. And it's run by a group called the Alda Centre. They're based out of the United States. We'll also hear from Colette Murphy. She's a professor in the School of Education in Trinity College Dublin. And here's what happened in UCD. My name is Neve Shaw. I'm a performer, communicator and um, scientist with a passion for space. Today we have uh, two colleagues from the Alda Centre in New York who are specialists in providing science communication workshops using improv. So we've been here, there's been uh, 20 of us, um, we've been put through the mill, uh, going through all sorts of theatre games and um, improv improvisations and we're at the point now where we're learning how to pitch exactly what it is that we do. And just tell me, give me, tell me a little bit uh, in a couple of sentences of, about what you do. Uh, so I do computer simulations of uh, the... What are computer simulations? I'd say I don't know that. So I try to see what's happening in the lab but I do it on the computer without ever going into the lab. Without ever going into the lab. And what are the simulations about? They're about growing the thinnest possible materials we can ever grow. Mm. Thinner than anything else. Thinner than? Thinner than a piece of paper. Thinner than an atom? One atom thick. One atom thick. Well, firstly, atom the thing, thing is, what I notice is that they all start laughing very early on, so they become very natural and very comfortable uh, within a few minutes of doing improv. And when you're natural, your own natural char- charisma carries you and brings you so much more presence uh, when you go to communicate. So that's the very first thing I see, no matter what workshop I've given over uh, over the last couple of years, that always happens. And then uh, you drill down and you try to help them find new ways of communicating what they do. Because it's like what comes up in this workshop here, is that knowledge sometimes is your enemy because you're so close to your own area of expertise, you can't see what other people don't know. And you can kind of get stuck in your head. And also then uh, a second element that I always see in workshops is that you get them uh, aware of this and they start to see things differently and find new ways of communicating their message. I think the biggest fear that scientists have is um, being wrong. You know that that they that we you know we have a tendency to, to check our information and double check and and quote data and have all the jargon correct and uh, improv is the antithesis of that. Not not to say that science isn't preserved, it is, but what it does is it allows them to see their work differently, and to get through that they have to accept that failure is part part of life and it's also part of getting things right. You have to go through a sea of of confusion and laughter to uh, understand what it is that you're trying to say. So by the end of a workshop we will have helped them see their research differently and find ways of communicating it, maintaining the scientific message but making it more appealing to the general audience. And also when they go to stand up on stage and speak to their peers they do it with more charisma, more presence and more passion behind what it is that they're researching. My name is Carol Schindler and I am an improv instructor at the Alda Center. Scientists um, sometimes feel that they cannot be understood. So part of our work is to help them reframe their science in a way so that anybody can understand it. So we actually have an exercise that helps them work that muscle. And so, and what we do is we have them, uh, we have somebody give them a hobby and they see if they can relate their science to that person's hobby. And sometimes it feels really forced, but that's okay. We don't care. We're getting them to exercise this muscle. So we put them through their paces where they talk to several different hobbyists and see, oh, how does my science relate to uh, knitting? How does my science relate to jogging? How does my science relate to tennis? How do, and and they, is there an analogy that I can use? And you know what? Most of the time they can find one. That was brilliant. Now, 
this time, it's your turn, right? Okay. So you are now the scientists, they are the hobbyists, and you okay. will walk around on the other end, okay. and you all will shift mm -hmm. down. And then after we do that three times, then we'll do, do, do the debrief, all right? Mm -hmm. So everybody ready for another round? And, and you know your hobbies here. You guys have got your hobbies. Begin. <laughs> So you're going to stand in front of us, and she's going to tell you what her hobby is. Scuba diving. Scuba diving. So now your job is to see if you can relate what you're doing, this computer simulations, to scuba diving, so that she might better understand it. So. So one of the exercises was to um, pitch what you do uh, talking to somebody with a hobby, a non-science hobby, and trying to find a way of connecting them with that. And everybody was able to do it because they were out of their heads and just in their body and just in the moment and communicating and connecting with that person. So when you do your paddy qualification for scuba diving, I guess that there's classes and then there's in the water. Yeah, so what we do essentially is we never get into the water. Ah, that's good. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> so uh, we can really test out what would happen if you went scuba diving in the Red Sea, and if you went scuba diving in the Arctic, and you went scuba diving in Ireland. We can test all that out without ever getting into the water. Because obviously, to get into the water, it's the Red Sea, or Ireland, or whatever. Um, but we can just theoretically try it out on the computer. And that worked, didn't it? That worked, let's give my hand. So it just helps them to, we're, we're saying, find some common ground with people. Improv began, I guess you could say, with the Compass Players in, at, at the University of Chicago back in the 50s. That's when they, they just decided to take a risk and to use the, the headlines in the newspaper and what was happening in the news and just riff on it and do scenes. And that slowly developed into uh, more of that kind of work. And Paul Sills, who's the son of Viola Spolin, she actually wrote the very first book on improv. It was called Theater Games. It was about theater games. He took her principles to help the cast that was doing this improvising, you know, off the, off the top of their heads, so to speak. And he helped to give that some kind of form and structure so that they had exercises that could contain this. Because when you're improvising, it's huge. You can go anywhere. But sometimes it needs to be contained, such as a rule like yes and, where you don't negate anything or block someone's reality, but you are always adding to that reality. So that's so improv started out as that wild thing, and then and now I would define it as an art form that takes audience suggestions to create scenes, songs, games, poems, whatever on the spot. So I'm Simon Elliott. I'm a researcher in Tyndall National Institute in Cork. It's been a great day's learning because I think we get a lot at workshops like this we're sort of sitting here going oh I'm up next oh no I'm going to make all these people are going to see me make a mess of it and it's not about that at all and we really have to get across to participants that that's not the point you're not here to impress people uh, you're here to try it out yourself and if you don't try it out yourself you won't have that experience and you won't learn so just get over the fact there are other people in the room get up there try it out uh, and, and that's how you'll change. So first of all, anytime you're making a connection with somebody, you're feeling something, you experience it. And most of us are used to just being talking heads, especially scientists, I think, because they're so in their head with all of their science. But making a connection is felt actually in your body. It's not something that you think about. It's something that you experience. So these improv exercises that we use with scientists are actually geared to help them feel what is going on when they make a connection with a person or when they make a connection with an audience. So we put them through all different kinds of paces and all different kinds of experiences so that they can walk away saying, oh, this is what this feels like. My eye contact, when I make eye contact with a person, there's actually something happening between the two of us. Were you nervous Yeah, when you got up there? Did it get better once you were out there? Why? Why did it get better? Because your actions are the worst. Like, Talk more about that. Describe negative. it. Like, you know, you can, your worst case scenario that you probably go to in your head is that 
people get up and leave or they boo or they're like, you know, like, you know like, that's how you like when you start thinking about that, you kind of go it and escalate it completely out of proportion. But when you actually get up there, it's nowhere near what you've built up in your mind to be. So you got up there and you were fabulous. All of you were. You rolled with it. What were you doing? What was going through your head as you were engaging with us? Were you focused on, oh my God, do I look good in black? <laughs> you do, by the way. Fabulous. <laughs> what were you focused on while you were out there? People's reactions. You were mirroring. You knew what to say and what to do. None of the lines were rehearsed. What a powerful lesson. I'm Laura Lindenfeld. I direct the Alan Alda Center for Communicating Science. The overall mission of the center is to transform society. <laughs> it really is. We're the center, the center is there. Our vision is to make science a fundamental part of the culture. There are a couple of things that we do differently from how others approach science communication, and there's some similarities. One of the key things I think that differentiates us is that we use improvisational theater techniques, which sometimes scare scientists at first. They think it's about being humorous and funny, and it's really not, although that could be a byproduct. It's about connecting. The other thing that's different as, uh, about us is that we're, we're based at a university, and we leverage the full resources of the university to bring research about science communication training to the practice. So we're doing both curriculum design and practice and research on science communication. It's such an interesting question of what the barriers are for scientists and what they need to overcome. And, and there's such a wide array of challenges that people face. Maybe I can give you a few examples. For many scientists, the use of jargon is a stumbling block. It's, it's something that their careers and lives depend on. They have to get published using jargon. And yet, when they go talk to an audience that doesn't understand their jargon, it's like the proverbial lead hitting the ground, thunk. <laughs> For others, it's about confidence or even the willingness to engage in something different. What I love about what we do, the improv, it tends to open people up and it what I love most about it is that it, it, it provides you with a lens into a completely different way to think about your work and how to communicate it. So we see people starting blogs or we had one, one young woman who started a, a, a blogging company as a result of working with us. We see people taking risks and reaching out and really trying to make science part of the culture by making it interesting. You know the drill. Next up, you're all gone. You're all gone. <laughs> <laughs> <Just suck it. laughs> Hi, I'm Jennifer, and I uh, have found bacteria that grow in the Dead Sea. Because in fact, the Dead Sea is not dead, even though it's very hot, 55 degrees, and salty. In fact, there's a lot of bacteria that live in the Dead Sea. So we take those bacteria and use them to make medicines. The reason being that because they can live in these high temperatures and hostile environments, they're very useful to man use for manufacturing. So we take the bacteria and we, cha we change them because we need to change the sequence so that they can make the medicines for us. And we use these to produce kilogram quantities of these drugs. One of the coolest things about this job is that we see incredible transformations in people. You may not see that after one day, but when we work with someone for a while, we see people who may have thought, I'll never be good at this, I'm a terrible storyteller, to telling these amazing stories and really getting their, if it's a faculty member, getting their students involved, uh, starting initiatives on their own. It's, it's amazing how much people change. That's the best part of my job is seeing that. There's something in experiential learning. It takes you out of your mind. And scientists, of course, we're always in our mind, we're always reading, and we're always thinking. And when you start doing things through your body, you, your attention changes, and you start to do things more naturally and more spontaneously. When you do that, you discover new things, and you discover that you're actually a natural storyteller, and that you have a natural ability to explain your science in a very engaging and straightforward way, and that you can pitch it to all types of audiences.
My name is Kay Nolan. I'm an associate professor in the UCD School of Biology and Environmental Science. And so today I've been attending a workshop on communication, science communication. And what I've learned today is that the success of communication in science depends not so much on the content that you're trying to get across, but rather on your engagement with both the content and the audience. It's important, I feel, because people need to be scientifically literate. In the modern age, science impacts on everybody, from whether or not you vaccinate your kids, to whether or not you conserve water or help to deal with climate change, you need to understand the rationale behind it. For scientists, it's very important because scientists depend on funding. Most of the funding comes from the government. That means taxpayers' money. So in order to, to for selfish reasons, scientists need to ensure that the taxpayer is happy that their money goes to fund research. Right, uh, I'm Padraig Murphy. I'm a researcher and uh, academic at uh, Dublin City University in science communication. And I came along to this today. Um, I suppose I'm supposed to know loads about science communication, but it's great to come along to something practical like this because we don't always get involved in this type of thing. And, I, and I'm really interested in, in drama and how drama and science can interact. And this is a really exceptional workshop because... It was really interesting and I was really amazed at how many uh, researchers or people involved in research fields here, how they uh, were just lost all inhibitions as it were, you know, they were able to kind of put themselves in the position of the listener or the audience and interact. The more they kind of understood that they had to participate in order to understand this, they really grew with this. So it, it really was about uh, working as teams or responding and being able to respond in that way. Uh, th these kind of activities are, are absolutely, I think they, they should be used for all scientists really. <laughs> um, so what struck me here was that almost right off the bat, what we heard was laughter, people enjoying themselves. Um, and I think from my own experience as an educator, that's music to my ears when I'm in a classroom with people learning that they're having fun and that they're in this sort of playful mindset where they're trying out new things. Um, and I think that was something that came through really strongly in this clip. And I think that there's no coincidence that it was all around this workshop focusing in on improv, which is in itself a really playful aspect. Yeah, and I think from an education point of view, play is a really powerful tool because it allows you to free yourself of where you are at the moment and to explore new spaces and new places, the imagined self. And so uh, I do this with my students sometimes when they're, they're learning how to teach. They're student science teachers. And I'd say to them at the very beginning, just imagine yourself a successful science teacher um, and act up into that role and they do it and then at the end they're going wow I was able to like you know I, I didn't get it completely but I was able to to take on some of the characteristics of where I wanted to go and uh, when you're in that space I think you're more forgiving too of errors you might make because Absolutely. you're just playing around mm -hmm. um, so yeah it's 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 such a sort of a plastic thing isn't it you know that mm -hmm. you can pull yourself away from your, your rest position and try new things and if you have a guide like these guys from the Alda Centre they can really help you with some rules like the yes and rule that they mm -hmm. talked about in improv to, to make that play somewhat useful Absolutely. And I think it's it's really important to note that obviously like play is how we learn for a huge portion of our young lives. That's, you know, how how we actually come to, to understanding an awful lot of concepts as, as young children. And it's something that sometimes we forget as adults. And it's only when somebody gives you an opportunity or prods you often to say, OK, let, we're going to play um, that you actually do that. So, you know, for example, you doing it with your students or in this case, a room full of scientists being urged on by uh, by the, the facilitators to, to, to use improv in this way to address some of their their subject area that they probably have never thought of doing that before. Yeah, and they're, they're all there to learn more about science communication and the mm. idea of being playful with that is something that I think you and I would probably have an awful lot to say about <laughs> right because yeah. I, I think that science communication it, well it's very important we would say firstly mm. uh, but how it's done um, will dictate like you know uh, I suppose how it's done is going to have huge consequences on, on how it's played out mm. um, 
science communication, an awful lot of it can be just uh, here's some loads, here's some facts, right? Yeah, transmission of information. Yeah. yeah. And so this idea of play uh, here allows you to go beyond that, right? Mm-hmm. And to to try out new means of communicating what you do to mm-hmm. people who maybe don't know as much about it as you do. Absolutely. And I think there was a really lovely part in in, in that workshop where you heard um, one of the participants being challenged to talk about their research area in a way uh, using a, an interest of another person. So they mm. had to come up with a whole framework and a way of talking about their specialist field that is related to the person who they're actually trying to communicate to and with, which is a wonderful um, example and and. and kind of tool for making making obvious something that should be there in good science communication which is that it's not a one-way street that it's that it's ideally two two people engaging in a conversation as opposed to um, just me telling you something and you sitting and passively taking it in. Yeah, so like I, I think about this a lot. Like why is it that there's so much science communication that's just pushing stuff out? It strikes me like it's science by press release as opposed to <laughs> like here's an idea that, that I'm absolutely passionate about at the moment. I'd love to just talk about it mm-hmm. and get your opinion on it as well. You may not be expert in mm-hmm. what I'm expert in, but you should Surely you're going to have something interesting to say, mm-hmm. you know. Absolutely. And a, and a different v- way of looking at things. You know, I, as as a scientist myself, I, I've had lots of really interesting questions put to me over the years. And oftentimes it's by people who have nothing to do with the area of research that I was in. Um, and it was, you know, it, it gives you a totally different perspective on things. You, you've you worked in the Science Gallery in Dublin for a long time and they've explored where science and art combine. Mm-hmm. And what I really like about what they do is that they don't just use the arts to talk about science, but it's it's really a genuine collision. So it should be as interesting if you're a member of the arts community as it should be if you're a member of the science community community. And even though it's almost 10 years, I still think that this is a this is a, a fresh idea because this idea of not hiring the, the artist to come in and just interpret what the scientists are doing is really interesting because it's it's on the edges where interesting conversations are often had or where seemingly disparate areas overlap. And I suppose what they're doing is really playing with um, ideas that are common to science and to to art, absolutely, and it's it's creating this new hybrid where nobody is the expert, um, so everybody has a valid point of view. So, is power important then? Do you think because you don't have the control over the way it should be? Absolutely, and I think that's something that um, you know you can get carried away with it in science gallery talking about it. Uh, science gallery being this platform for for you know it's a democratization that everybody can come in. It's a very open public space. It's free access. Everyone can come in and have their own opinion on things and influence what's going on in that space. And I think that that's a really important thing to, to bring into any science communication, whether it's happening in, a, in the science gallery or whether it's, uh, you know, in, in a classroom or whether it's, you know, a, a, a radio show or a TV show that you have to try and be able to bring in those different types of, of, of perspectives and that it's not that that access it's not is there. One-sided. No, I, that I it's run not a, a, a program at the moment called Quavers to Quadratics and it sees undergraduate students from both music and physics uh, teach primary school children um, and they teach them about the things that music and physics have in common. Mm. And they, they don't say that explicitly with the young people. They ask them why are musical instruments the shapes they are and why are they made out of different materials? And then they explore those. Or, uh, actually, what we say is they play with those ideas mm-hmm. using the physics skills and the music skills. And whilst it's very interesting for the primary school children who take part, what I have seen and our research has shown is that the effect it's having on the undergrads is profound. It massively increases their sense of identity around their discipline. So it helps them see themselves as a physicist or indeed a musician in a much more concrete way. Mm. And I I started this uh, project and one thing I had in mind was that so many of my students who are scientists would say to me, I'm not a scientist you know, so this mindset of unless you're in the lab at the bench mm. doing research, then you can't call yourself a scientist. And so they weren't willing to describe themselves as scientists if they were students or indeed many student teachers wouldn't describe themselves as scientists. Indeed, many science teachers 
don't describe themselves as scientists or people who've left science don't say they're scientists anymore. Mm. And so I I would love to use playful platforms for people to to, to uh, re-energize themselves and sort of claim back their identity as scientists. Absolutely. Well, I, I have oh, I'm showing my nerdy roots here. I bought my daughter a T-shirt that says we are all scientists and it has a little picture of a, a baby sitting in a high chair who's dropping a like a baby rattle. Um, and I think that that's a really important idea to keep in your head um, that you've you've come to understand an awful lot of things about the world through your own empirical um mm-hmm experiments you know whether that's figuring out that things always fall down um, when you're a baby dropping something out of your out of your high chair or much more complicated things um, if you're a scientist in a lab for example but that we that that sort of trial and error that scientific process is a playful one and it is one that everyone's able to use so I actually uh, rang Colette Murphy who's a professor of science education in Trinity College Dublin and she was telling me just about this research has shown that play in rats has very positive effects on the brain. Obviously, we can't do this kind of research on people because it's not very ethical to cut their brains up after they've been playing. But in rats, um, the positive effects, there's two of them really. If you give one set of rats, you know, like enriched environments in which they've got lots of resources and they can play and run around and play with toys and things, Uh, There's two big changes in the brain which occur in them, but they don't occur in rats that don't have any um, resources if they're just like lonely and kept in horrible conditions. So the um, cerebral cortex in the brain is much bigger in rats that have had enriched environments. And also there is um, a chemical complex called um, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, I'm sorry, neurotrophic factor, BDNF, which is secreted only in the rats that have been in the resource-rich environments, which is essential for growth and maintenance of brain cells. So both in terms of the size of the brain and in terms of the health of the cells, um, play has shown that um, it improves both of those aspects of the brain. So that's one thing, you know, it's actually improves your brain. So your brain is important in learning. So that's one way it improves learning. Um, In education research, there's lots and lots of things, but two major things, I think, which come out of the research. One is that if we interrupt um, academic learning with breaks that are unstructured, in other words, that your brain is free. So it's not the same as going out for physical exercise or something, because that's usually very structured, but it's actually freeing your brain I mean, exercise has other good effects, but just freeing your brain to just relax for a while. Then that increases attention to academic learning. So interrupted learning is good. And the other thing is what you were doing, what you were talking about in the um, theatrical um, drama that you were saying, is that anything to do with creative drama, especially role play, it actually improves conceptual learning. It helps you develop concepts. So why does that happen is um, basically if we look at the theory of play, there's two characteristics of play. One is that all play involves an imaginary situation, right? So we're always, and any type of play at all involves you imagining something. And all play also involves rules. Even when we're just freely imagining something, say we want to play being X or Y, we make up our own rules. Or if we're doing an imaginary thing together, as your guys were doing in drama, you have to make rules to work with each other and, and, and to make it. So when you think in the theory, then this is basically what play is. It's imaginary situation and rules. And it's the interplay between them, which helps if we think of little children first, um, their imaginary situation helps them develop symbolic and abstract thought so even babies who are one can take neutral objects and maybe bang them on the table and having seen something like um, people playing drums or whatever they will then um, uh, use those spoons or whatever as symbols of a drum and they will use them like that Um, after kids can like walk when they're little toddlers they might use a stick as a horse, which is one of the commonest ways that children play with neutral objects. So all the time what they're doing is um, 
uh, using a stick as a symbol of a horse. So in their mind, they have a horse and they're acting into that horse using a stick. So they're developing abstract thought. And always when we play, when we're little and when we're adults, if you think of drama, you play above yourself. You play at something that you want to do or you need to do, but it's above, it's ahead of you. So it's, it's, it's forcing learning, if you like, or it's um, enabling learning. And the rules help us to develop teamwork and self-regulation. So when you think of that's going on all the time, what we say about children is that for little kids, we talk about play as imagination in action. And then for older kids and adults, we say that actually imagination is play without action. Because what you're kind of doing is playing in your head. Whereas when you're a child, you're playing kind of for your head, if you like. So that's kind of the, uh, uh, the how can it help you learn and why does that happen? And the, so what if we think of, um, you guys were doing communicating science in, in terms of both communicating and learning about science. This business of creative role play or creative theatre is it's massive. So if you get students, for instance, to act as molecules, and so they're just sort of rocking around the place, and then you get a met- metronome with the beat, and they have to be molecules according to the beat. And then you explain to them that for this play, the beat is going to represent energy or heat. And so as you increase the beat, they have to move more quickly. And by doing that, what they discover very quickly is that the, the more energy, the more space the molecules need to move. So this um, idea of heat and energy develops in them when they've done activities like this, where they play at being um, molecules with increased heat. It helps them to develop a more enriched concept of energy and its effects on particles or molecules or whatever. So you've got this idea then that... Um, when we, um, uh, here I am going, my emming, um, when we use creative play, drama, role play and everything in science learning, we could say that play is an important vehicle for developing deeper insights into anything, anything in science at all, rather than just learning words, which is actually, unfortunately, what we do a lot. And then people who communicate science, they try and do it only with words which isn't very helpful, uh, especially to people who aren't that scientific. So play also helps the, um, uh, another important thing in being a scientist, if you like, which is this dual effect. When you're playing, you know you're playing. And you've got the play situation and you've got the real life. And so it's the awareness of these two that scientists need. So they're doing experiments, which could be considered playing, they're getting data or results or observations and they then have to play with that and at the same time they have to then use that play to help them consider how can this be applied in real life so that 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 dual effect is always coming out from um, natural play when we play from when we're babies we know that we're playing but it's it's just the awareness of all this It, it, it helps people um, basically, it helps people do as well as to communicate science. I've got three nice little quotes. One of them is a quote attributed to Einstein. His quote is a bit more boring, but um, basically what he's saying is, play is the highest form of research, which is quite nice. And secondly, the psychologist Carl Jung. Um, Jung says, the creation of something new is not accomplished by the intellect, but by the play instinct. And thirdly, my favorite one is from Roald Dahl. A little nonsense now and then is cherished by the wisest men. (laughs) So what's really interesting about what Colette said is that children are natural scientists. And what I love uh, about that is that in this podcast episode, all of the students are scientists. So all those people who are working with the ALDA Centre that Neve's talking about, they're all scientists. So like... 
I wonder, um, like, what's happening in there? Are they more receptive to learning about science communication in an open way? The ALDA Centre is not taking them by the hand and yeah, leading them. Absolutely. They're being given a kind of a, a tool. They're being given this improv tool and they're being asked to, to experiment with it, to play with it. And you can hear them really getting into it. And what's really great is at the end when they're speaking with the different the different students in the, in the workshop, you're actually hearing how they they're talking about how they learned with it and they're talking about how what they gain from using this this improv tool to to give them new skills in, in communication without actually being explicitly taught about edu- uh, about communication which yeah, I think is cool. I I think that's that's really important. Like the Alda Center could have been the regular commoner garden outfit where they come and show you a very flashy PowerPoint presentation <laughs> oh, no. and they're like here's our top 10 tips on how to communicate science. You need to do this that and the other and it's so formulaic and it's so flashy but yet at the end of the day whilst you may feel that you have been entertained you may not have been empowered or you may not have been transformed. And mm. so what I think was amazing what they re- what they did was that they used something Something called pedagogy. So they had they, like the science of teaching or uh, mm-hmm. I suppose the knowledge of teaching. Yeah. And so they thought about their learners, their students, and they, they put into practice something, mm-hmm. right? You know, they, they put something into practice rather where uh, it was well thought through and it was based on knowing how those people would respond and knowing how they might learn. Yeah, and knowing how to kind of push them beyond something that they're familiar with to, to actually get into that playful space where they're trying out something entirely new. Yeah, I read recently that uh, this is, is most effective and you can hear it in the end uh, of that piece where they're so enthusiastic about what's happened that they can feel that transformation. Yeah, it is that moment. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that great buzz that you have at the end of a class, whether you're in it or teaching it. And that you're like, that went so well, mm. right? Uh um, and, and they have that in spades. And um, it made me think of how powerful pedagogy can be in transforming a, a learning experience. And also that you need to be aware of edutainment, right? This mm. sense that you can sit there and think, wow, this is great, but it has very little effect. And research has shown that really good communicators as lecturers are not as effective in education as they like to think they are. Mm. And that often average communicators who use pedagogy are better teachers in terms of what the students actually yeah, take on of, yeah. exactly yeah absolutely no and 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 you can hear that here because well they're both uh, <laughs> this group they're they're really good uh, communicators and that they're really imp- you know impassioned and they're they're kind of you can tell that they love what they're doing but they're also grounding that in 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 really good pedagogy and they're using really useful tools which they've clearly thought about with their students Okay, so that's us for this episode. Thank you so much for listening. Um, You can find us in lots of places. We're at 101 The Podcast. We're also on social media. um, And you can find out all about us and all the episodes on 101thepodcast.com. And if you are interested in hearing more, um, you can also search for us on whatever way you get your, your podcast by looking for 101 The Ways We Learn. But we'd also like to ask you a little favour. If you enjoyed the show, it'd be great if you could go and give it a good rating on iTunes or wherever you catch five your stars, podcast. Five stars. Five stars. stars. <laughs> <laughs> because this is how uh, we might bring it to other people. And you know how passionate we are about people learning about learning. So give us a hand. We've been Shane Bergen and Jane Chadwick. 101 is produced by Bureau and it's supported by Science Foundation Ireland. Hi, I'm Margie McCarthy. I'm the Head of Education and Public Engagement with Science Foundation Ireland. And we're really happy to support 101 because there's a science behind everything and there's a science behind learning as well. 